Hello everyone, this is Robert D. Bennett. The video you're about to watch is for a book I wrote called The Bottle Tree, and I want to tell you just a little about this project. Then we'll listen to some music, look at some pictures, and finally I'll do a reading from the book. The Bottle Tree is set in a turpentine and lumber camp that really existed in what is now the Cossatchee National Forest in central Louisiana, between Natchitoches and Leesville. My grandfather and his family lived and worked in that camp when he was just a little boy. I've been to the actual location of the camp, and there's still a mass of the pine rosin that is solidified into what looks like a rock and sticks out into the creek there. When I was working on the book, I did a lot of research on how hard life was for the people there. I found this song about the life of someone working in a turpentine camp that will play while some pictures are shown. The song is You Better Lie Down by Scott Ainsley, who is a great bluesman. Give it a listen, look at the pictures, and then I'll read a few pages from the book The Bottle Tree. If you get a chance, go by my website, robertdbennett.com, or take the time to like my Facebook author page, and then tell me what you thought about this video and the book. To stop waking me up at four o'clock. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Look mighty cloudy, but it ain't gonna rain. Look on the table, it's the same old thing. All of you old. stars and the moon All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down Big piece of bacon and a little streak of lean Strong cup of coffee and no sugar been seen All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down If I'd have known my captain was mean, I would have left St. Augustine. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. And now, a few pages from the bottle tree. Chapter 8, Training Bow. Johnny, you're going to have to run faster than that. Bo will catch you in no time. I can't run no faster, Caleb, Johnny said, bending over and breathing hard, the pelt of a recently killed raccoon tied to the end of a string running from his belt. The skin keeps getting hung up on stuff. He yanked on the string to show that the drag was, even now, tangled in more briars. Caleb flopped down on the path and put his hands on his cheeks to think. We need a real coon, but I don't see how it's likely to happen. He thought some more. So if we can't get a real coon then we have to use a skin and a fake coon to lay the trail, right? Johnny nodded in agreement. We already know you're too slow, and at least he's even slower than you are. I can't do it because I've got to work bow. What about your other friends? Johnny asked hesitantly. He was still afraid that if Caleb's other friends were around, he wouldn't be welcome. Nah, you're the fastest kid around, and besides, I wouldn't trust none of them to help me with bow. He didn't notice how Johnny's face lit up when he said this. Nobody other than his parents, and particularly nobody white, had ever trusted him to do anything. The best he had ever hoped for was to remain unnoticed and undisturbed. Bo was at Lisey's now, tied to a tree in her yard and kept mollified by Lisey's attention and the table scraps she fed him. Caleb had left her with strict instructions about the dog's care. He had been mortified once when he had returned from a fishing trip with his dad to find Lisey had tied ribbons around Bo's neck. A tire entirely unbecoming what was sure to be the greatest coon dog in the history of Louisiana. We need a real coon. They can run fast, duck in and out of brush piles and tight places, and climb trees. He continued thinking and absentmindedly scratched the ears of one of Mrs. Fenstrom's cats that had wandered up and began rubbing against him. Johnny unhooked the coon skin from his leg and began teasing the cat with it. 
flipping it in front of him, then dragging it back trying to get the cat to follow it. The cat was less than enamored with the process and would half-heartedly grab at it, but not with the usual cat intensity. Eventually, Caleb started watching the game between his friend and the cat, wondering why the cat wasn't more interested. Johnny's next throw landed the skin on top of the cat, who immediately started bucking and spitting until the hateful thing was dislodged. Johnny and Caleb looked at each other and smiled. Some ingenuity, some more string, and a couple of dozen claw marks later, the boys had a reasonable facsimile of a raccoon. If raccoons hissed and spat and meowed loudly and as if in pain. That'll work, Caleb said, inspecting their project, which Johnny was holding at arm's length, dodging all four legs and the arsenal attached to them as much as possible. Caleb ran to Lisey's and untied Bo from the tree, grabbing the end of the leash and holding on as Bo went through the normal minute or so of gymnastics before settling in and accepting the notion that the leash wasn't going anywhere. Lisey followed the two back to where Johnny continued dancing around, mostly avoiding the clawing attempts by the enraged cat. The feline's frantic activities increased exponentially when it saw Bo, who was already the most hated dog among the camp's cat community. As Bo lunged, Caleb dropped to his knees and put the dog in a headlock, both he and the hound rocking back and forth as he struggled to free himself and get to the cat, which was flopping around and making lots of noise as Johnny continued to dodge the flailing limbs and claws. Oh, be careful, Lisey said. Don't hurt the poor thing. Him or me, Johnny asked, ducking and narrowly missing a raking across the cheek. When I say go, Caleb said, growing the words out between Bo's leaps forward and backward, you chunk the cat toward the woods. I'll give him a head start and then let Bo go. Oops! Bo had given a healthy leap backwards, changing both tactics and direction, and his head popped from between Caleb's arms. With a leap, Bo hit Johnny. Unfortunately for the boy, the cat was on a pendulum swing toward him at that instant, and the extra momentum enabled him to get four good claw holes on Johnny at the exact instant the boy's grip relaxed. The cat did as cats do when confronted with danger from below. He climbed up. For a few seconds, the sight would have been comical to anyone watching who didn't have a vested interest in dog, friend, cat, or skin, but none of the participants laughed. The cat perched on top of Johnny's head, back arched and every hair that could be seen standing on end. The cat hissed, Johnny yelled, and Bo barked furiously as he tried to climb Johnny as well, although he only succeeded in knocking the boy backwards. When the cat realized his proximity to the dog was still too close, he leapt down and took off running toward the woods, immediately followed by the dog, who was not able to catch up because he kept tripping over the leash. Caleb missed his dive to grab the rope and now ran after the dog, followed closely by Johnny and then Lisey although Johnny was slower than usual as he spent part of his energy inspecting himself for any serious cat-related injuries. All three of the kids dove with the leash at different times during the chase, although it was rare that they got close enough to have a real shot at grabbing it. All they had to show for their endeavors were scratches and scrapes as the leash stayed out of their grasp. From the sounds, Bo caught the cat at least once in a brush pile, but since the cat shot out the other side, still at the same pace as when the chase had begun, Caleb assumed the raccoon fur which was still attached had protected him from Bo. We gotta grab him! This isn't doing any good! He's not tracking, he's just chasing! Caleb yelled. The chase continued through a stand of trees. The cat, apparently disillusioned with his last vertical venture, ignoring the opportunity to climb in favor of continuing at a full out run. Lisey managed to get her hands on Bo's leash once, but her grip was broken when he dragged her for a couple of feet. She managed to slow him enough for Johnny and Caleb to nearly catch up and for the cat to stretch its lead. The next clearing had several brush piles in it and Bo seemed to be having a hard time figuring out where the cat was. He narrowed it down to two mounds and was running back and forth between them baying when the kids hit the clearing. When the dog saw them, he realized he was about to be grabbed and launched himself into the biggest pile. I want to thank you for your time listening and ask you to go visit my website, drop me an email if you've got any questions about anything, and, if you feel like it, pick up a copy of the bottle tree. Again, thank you for your time, and I hope to visit with you sometime in the future.